Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes, one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to welcome you to this service of Worship with the Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are so grateful that you are worshiping here with us today, and we hope that this will be a meaningful time for you. We'd love the chance to connect with you, so if you would, please take a minute and sign in. You can use either the link that's in this video description, or you can uh, scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in just a few moments. That will take you uh, to a little survey where you are able to give us your name, let us know that you are worshiping with us, and let us know how we can be praying for you. Now I invite you to take a deep breath and prepare your hearts for worship. Please join me now in prayer. Holy and loving God, we thank you so much for calling us to worship you this morning. We thank you that we are united in you and in your presence, even when we are physically far apart. Lord, in this time, we ask that your spirit would fall on us. Would you open up our ears that we would hear from you? Would you open up our hearts to receive your love? Would you open our minds to have a new insight about you? And Lord, as we leave this time, would you open our hands in service to your world? We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh 
invite you now to stand wherever you are as you are able and join in the Apostles' Creed using the words that are found on your screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today's reading is Psalm 96, Praise to God Who Comes in Judgment. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come to his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. This is the word of the Lord. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when song gives place to sign, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him. From care he sets me free, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. 
I sing because I'm free His eyes on the spiral And I know he cares for me We have the privilege now of going before our God in prayer. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for bringing us together today. Lord, we thank you that so many years ago, you made a covenant with Abraham that you would be our God and we would be your people. We thank you that Abraham, even when he could not see how this promise would be true, chose to believe you. And Lord, we thank you that through your son, Jesus Christ, we too have been adopted into your family and share in your promises to Israel. Lord, help us to be your people in the world. Help us as we try to live out the vision that you have for your world. In that spirit, Lord, we pray today for the hungry, for the hopeless, and the heartbroken. We pray especially for the people of Afghanistan as they try to rebuild their lives and their communities following the earthquake this week. And Lord, we pray for those who we are particularly concerned about, and we name them before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you have called us your people. Lord, would you give us faith like Abraham to follow you anywhere and to be caught up into your beautiful plan for the world. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. We come now to the time in our service where we have the chance to give back to God a portion of what has been given to us. We know that God provides in abundance for all of God's children. And so part of our worship is returning some of our treasure back to God. There are several ways that you can give today. You can always give through the post service. You can also give on our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, or by using our smartphone app. As we prepare now to worship God through our giving, will you join me in prayer? Generous God, we thank you for all the ways that you provide for us. Help us in this time to learn to trust you as we turn back a part of what you have given to us. Lord, we pray that as we give, we would be blessed, that we would be conformed to your generous character. And we pray that all of these gifts would be used for your purposes in the world to build your kingdom. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
So now it's time for the children's message. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. And if you have children or youth nearby who are not already watching this video, now's a great time to call them over. So I'm recording this video in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And you can see behind me is in the distance is an old fort. It's actually the oldest fort in Puerto Rico. It's about 500 years old. It was never conquered or defeated in battle. And it's, very, it's a massive structure with very thick walls and cannonballs would just bounce off of those walls hundreds of years ago. It reminds me of a scripture verse from Psalm 18 verse 2 that tells us that God is our rock and our fortress. God promises to protect us and keep us safe. Now this fort was never defeated in battle. It was never captured for 500 years. Never captured in battle. God has been protecting his people for a lot longer than that. And that's why uh, the Bible encourages us to put our faith and our trust in God, that God will strengthen us, God will guide us, God will protect us. And so I encourage you today to let God be for you even stronger and better than what this fort behind me was for the people of Puerto Rico. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks that you are our rock and our strength, our rock and our fortress. And we pray that you'll continue to protect us and guide us. Protect us and keep us safe. Bless the children and youth of our church and community and all those watching this video today and their families. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning and welcome back. Glad that you have taken time to visit with us and worship with us today at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here. And, uh, and again, uh, I'm glad that you have taken time out of your busy schedule to worship with us. If this is your first time, I hope that um, you will find this service inspiring and that you will join us again in the future. We're continuing our summer sermon series looking at the story of salvation that runs from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, and so each and every week we're going to be looking at a different slice of the Bible that talks specifically about God's unrelenting desire to be in relationship with us and what our role is in all of that. So today we pick up in Genesis chapter 15 beginning in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You've given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and count the stars, if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Lord, I pray that you will inspire us anew this day, that we might hear what you would have us hear. And Father God, if um, there are points that I'm making that are not yours, Lord, I pray that um, you will forgive me and that we will hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the uh, actor and director Woody Allen once quipped, if there is a God, he must be the ultimate underachiever. Now I realize that's a jarring way to start a sermon and I personally find the statement offensive it's unthinkable that God would want to do less than the very best for the world that he created. However, these deflating words are probably not too distant from the attitude of Abraham at the beginning of Genesis chapter 15. Abraham has waited expectantly for the child that God has promised to him and his wife Sarah. 
He has eagerly anticipated the joy of a son who would continue, continue the lineage of his family. But his patience and his anticipation have run thin. He has experienced the days turning into weeks, weeks turning into months, and months turning into years and years and years, and still no son. So when a word from God is revealed in a vision that speaks about a promise of great rewards, Abraham can't help but protest. What do you mean a reward? How can you say you will give me anything when you have not kept your first promise of a son? Because you have not kept your promise, a slave born in my house is to be my heir. I must say I expected more from the creator of the universe. Well, if we are honest, there are times when Abraham's protest is the same as our protest. Deep disappointments compel us to shake a fist at God for not fulfilling our expectations. Circumstances in life have not turned out the way we had hoped. Our lives have tur not turned out the way we had planned. Dreams have been shattered. Promises have been broken. Goals were admired but never realized. Honest and earnest prayers appear to have found no results. Life just doesn't work out the way it's supposed to. And so we're angry. We're angry with God. We're angry with life. We're angry with ourselves. In Arthur Miller's play, The Price, there's a scene where a couple is reminiscing about their lives together. And as they reflect on their past, they sense what a disappointment their lives have been. They recall all the goals which were never realized. And climactically, the wife says to her husband, Everything was always temporary with us. It's as if we were never anything. We were always just about to be. We've all been there, waiting desperately for the fruition of a hope that never seems to come along. It's very agonizing and painful. We can only stand on our tiptoes for so long. Soon our hope shrinks before our growing disappointment. We become hopeless and doubts settle deep within our spirit. God heard and felt a similar restlessness and hopelessness within Abraham. So God led him outside to count all the stars of the sky. Long before there was light pollution brought on by city lights, Abraham would have seen more stars than he could possibly count. And God shared with him that his heir, his very own son, would produce as many descendants as there were stars in the sky. Now, at this point, we would expect Abraham to chime in with the cynical sigh, hell oh, sure, promises, promises. And that's what most of us would have done. But this time, Abraham's response is different. No complaints, no questions, no doubts, only belief that all of God's promises would soon be fulfilled. Now, as we follow this dialogue, now is the time that some might ask, wait, wait, wait a minute, what just happened here? One moment, Abraham is pouting and whining, and the next moment, he's a bona fide believer. One moment, we're living vicariously through Abraham as he complains to God, and the next moment, Abraham accepts God's promise, and a big crown of righteousness is placed upon his head. Did we miss something here? What caused Abraham to move from doubt to faith so swiftly? The passage doesn't really appear to help us in any way. For after God shares with Abraham the promise, Scripture simply reads, And Abraham believed the Lord. That's it. God said it. Abraham believed it. That settles it. Or was there more to the story than that? Maybe pivotal pieces to this sacred conversation are missing from the text. It's possible. Perhaps God answered all of Abraham's questions and doubts about the delayed promise, and now Abraham was satisfied. Or maybe God led Abraham beyond the stars and gave him a big glimpse into the future filled with a great land and a blessed ancestry and said, if you'll just believe, all of this will be yours. Not bad explanations. If they were true, it would certainly make it easier to understand Abraham's abrupt faith. But all we have are the words, he believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. What exactly happened that special night under the stars? I believe the key to understanding this remarkable transformation is to shift our focus away from Abraham and on to God. 
After all, this is where the scripture is actually leading us. For Abraham to believe God in spite of his circumstances was nothing less than a miracle. The brilliant Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann put it this way, Abraham did not move from protest to confession by knowledge or persuasion, but by the power of God who reveals and causes his revelation to be accepted. This is important. This idea of faith is really foreign to many of us because we typically see faith as something that we provide instead of something that God gives to us. But faith can only happen when we allow God to give it to us. We come to faith through God's initiative, not ours. When we begin to gain this understanding, we begin to see faith as giving in to the power of God and permitting that power to have control over our lives. The eloquent preacher John Claypool remembers when he had this epiphany regarding faith. He stated, faith is not believing the unbelievable, nor is it committing intellectual suicide and taking a leap in the dark. But faith is a response on our part to the inthrust of God. <coughs> I believe this is what happened to Abraham. God entrusted power and promise upon Abraham, and that caused Abraham to entrust God in return. He finally arrived at the place where he waved the white flag of surrender and confessed that he needed God's power more than he needed his own agenda. Does that make any sense? We're not going to get very far in this salvation story if we think we have to do it on our own. Salvation begins with acknowledging our need for God. Sometimes it takes a great deal of time before we learn what it means to have faith. Why do you think we often hear of people who come to faith when they're in the midst of great despair and anguish? It's not that God wills pain or suffering on anyone, but often people are just more open to the power and purposes of God when pride and selfishness are weakened. I'm in deep, we cry out to God. I'm deeper, God replies. How deep, we ask. Let go and see, God says. Henry Nouwen beautifully illustrates faith as letting go when he recounts his experiences of seeing a German trapeze troupe perform. After the breathtaking performance, Nouwen sat down with Rodley, the leader of the troupe, and asked him how he was able to perform with such grace and precision. Rodley explained, The public might think that I'm the great star of the trapeze, but the real star is Joe, my catcher. The secret is that the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. When I fly to Joe, I've simply to stretch out my arms and hands and wait for him to catch me. The worst thing the flyer can do is try to catch the catcher. I'm not supposed to catch Joe. It's Joe's task to catch me. Such insightful truth applies to the principle of faith. Oftentimes we misunderstand faith as the ability to grab onto God by affirming certain beliefs about God. But that requires intellectual work, which can be stimulating, it can be inspiring, but it's not faith. Faith is allowing God to grab you wherever you are. For instance, when Jesus called the disciples, he didn't say, before you can become my disciples, I need to tell you who I am and then find out if you're going to believe in me or not. No, on the contrary, he simply said, follow me. And the belief and understanding came only after they gave in and followed him. To use a metaphor, falling in love does not require an intellectual understanding or belief in love. The power of love does not invade only those who believe in it or desire for it. In fact, love often comes unannounced. Even cynics have come to rest in the arms of love. And later, those same cynics come to know and believe in love's power. The same could be said of God. Assuming that we must provide some intellectual assent to everything we can discover about God in order to have faith presupposes that we're able to figure everything out. What a ridiculous notion. We're not capable of grabbing God by our own efforts or our own mental gymnastics. We're only capable of allowing God to grab us. When we begin to understand faith in this manner, Abraham's change of heart starts to become clear. 
Abraham attained righteousness through faith, not because of what he did, but because of what he refused to do. Instead of controlling his life and destiny and taking God on his own terms, he accepted God on God's terms and rested in the truth that God's plan and promise was paramount, even if the timetable seemed uncertain. Abraham understood that hope is trusting that something is going to be fulfilled and fulfilled according to the promises of God and not according to my wishes. For Abraham, God was more than a vehicle for a promise. God became the Lord of his life. This is evident in Abraham's attitude and strength in the midst of he and his wife's barren situation. When Abraham first believed, his circumstances didn't change immediately. Sarah didn't come leaping up with the exclamation that she was pregnant, nor did a baby suddenly come by stork out of the starry sky. But Abraham's attitude changed. Instead of waiting in protest, he waited in hope. We see this Later in verse 8, when Abraham asks, Oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? <clears throat> For Abraham, the question was no longer if or when, but just how. Abraham was now confident that God's promise for him would be fulfilled. And so he looked toward the future with confidence. When we open up our lives to God's gift of faith, the promises of God take on a whole new meaning. The profound statement of faith found in Hebrews becomes real to us. That faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Our faith becomes a living out of the expectations that God's promises will be known by us in the future. I've been trying to come up with a better way to say that all week, and all I can do is just say it again. Our faith becomes a living out of the expectations that God's promise will be known by us in the future. Through our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, we constantly live with that hope. Our faith provides us with a vision of what God desires for us and the strength and conviction to go live out that vision. Back in Baltimore, Maryland, there lived an artist named Sophia Libman who suffered from macular degeneration, a disease which deteriorates the eyes and affects the vision. Now you'd think an impairment of this kind would be an artist's worst nightmare, but not so for Sophia Libman. Ironically, the disease helped her become a better artist. Because she's not able to see all the details, her ability to capture the essence of what she paints has actually increased. Her work has become more truthful, unencumbered by decorations. Her condition gives her the ability to envision and paint only the essentials. Similarly, when we fall into faith, our wishes, our expectations, our timetables for life become blurred. But God's vision for our life comes into a more prominent focus. Our agendas move to the periphery to make room for God's power, for God's purpose, for God's plan for us. And soon we're able to see God's will for our lives and we begin to live out God's promises. Haven't we waited long enough? Haven't we listened to the promises of God long enough? Isn't it time for us to follow Abraham's lead and open ourselves up to God's power and plan for our own lives? So why not let go and find faith? Give up and find God. Give in and find power. Fall back and find a future. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, we are grateful that you are always there to catch us. Lord, we are so desirous of things working by our agenda on our own plan and timetable. Father, help us to see your plan as best for our lives. Lord, give us patience and empower us with your faith so that we might know you better and deeper and understand your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
hey, if you live here locally and are involved in the life here of Wright Sweet United Methodist Church, or even if you're not, we'd love for you to be so. And so I want to tell you about a couple of ministries that we're doing right now, including a ministry with a charity called Family Promise. Family Promise works with ministry, excuse me, with families who are currently unsheltered and need a little help. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be providing meals to these families. These are uh, moms and dads with kids, and, um, and like I say, they're looking for a permanent place to live. And so we're going to provide some meals over the next couple of weeks. You can sign up to provide those meals um, by going to our e-blast at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Also want to let you know that next week is our annual patriotic service. We'll be having three live services here in the sanctuary at 815, 945, and 1115. But as we leave, as we depart for the day, I wanted us to think about um, that illustration that Henry Nouwen gave about the trapeze artist. I love that. And how the worst thing that we can do is try to grab hold on our own timetable, our own agenda, but rather we need to allow God to catch us and to infuse us with faith so that we can get on board with what God is doing, God's plan and God's purpose instead of our own will. I invite us to let go and let God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the love of God surround you, everywhere, everywhere you may.